Excellent. All right. G'day, everybody. It's uh, Craig or Crafty from Craftworks Distillery, uh, and I'm part of Australian Craft Distillers Shooting the Shit. So uh, tonight we're going to be interviewing someone, but uh, first let's uh, introduce the crew. So we have uh, Luke, IT expert, part-time distiller, brewer, and a mate, and uh, Luke is local nerd. What are you doing Hi. then? What are you doing, Luke? Pressing buttons and getting it all under control. And I've just poured myself a glass of the uh, the Chief's Son. Yeah, right. Nice. From my nice. whiskey loot yep. package. Yep, Australian one. Excellent. From Somerville, Victoria. Yep. I unfortunately don't have anything else at the moment. I've drunk it all. <laughs> I need to stock up. Yes, I think we're all in, in that boat a little bit. <laughs> all right. And the other one on the crew is my right-hand man, the Todd. So, Todd Pointer, what are you drinking, mate? Say good day. G'day, guys. Nice to see you all here tonight. Um, I'm drinking backwards. Tonight. Okay, you're still on that one, eh? Yeah, it's getting a little low now, though. But... Yeah, yeah it's, you've taken a few nudges out of that one. Yeah, yeah, it's had a bit of a hit. Excellent. Fine drop, yeah. too. Excellent. Mm. All right. And then we move on to the, the, um, the guest of the night, which is uh, Mr. John Jarvis from... Hobart Whiskey down in Tassie. G'day, John. How are you, mate? Good, mate. How are you going? How are all three of you going tonight? Yeah, yeah, going well. Go, going well. Just, um, yeah, we're just talking about um, what Australian uh, whiskey or, or spirit that we're drinking. And the idea behind this is uh, everyone's got something Australian in their glass. And if anyone's watching, then uh, hopefully they've got something in their glass as well. So first question for you, mate. What are you drinking? I've got two on the go. I couldn't decide. So I've uh, got a Launceston Distillery Car Strength Musket. Very um, nice. Ooh. I poured that one out and I was like, I'm just going to let this sit for a while. And so while I wait for that, I've got a Bourbon Car Spring Bay. Yeah, nice, mm. nice, excellent. <laughs> Nothing like drinking from the competition, eh? Yeah, well, no, you know, you've got to learn. Learn from the best in the industry and um, it's only going to make us stronger. <laughs> I'm really disappointed none of you there have got a Hobart bottle, you know, like hold up a Hobart. Like the uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm drinking tonight. So it's only a little bit different. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, this Requiem. is uh, Ian's and Vic's Requiem, which is an Australian pot still rum, the SS Ferret. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, I treated myself to that at Christmas time and I've been slowly getting through it. Rum's a little bit different than, than whiskey for me. I, I can't drink a lot of rum, but um, this one is. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a beautiful, beautiful sipping rum. So, uh, yeah, well done to those guys at uh, Tin Shed and Equity. Yum. Um, I have to say, I'm yeah. a little bit worried when you when you intro the the clip tonight. You're like you're going to be interviewing me, and I thought it was much more casual than that. It, it is casual. So, you don't know, use the word interview. I mean, I thought we we're having a chat. <laughs> Actually. We're not. We're having a shooting the shit session. That's that's what's going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's going on. Yeah. No, we. Um, uh, so what we do is, um, yeah, we podcast this as well, and uh, it's on Facebook Live. It's on Zoom, and um, we also put it onto YouTube. So we get people who watch it on YouTube after the event, and some of them don't know what it's about. And uh, so yeah, it's uh, shooting the shit. It's having a conversation with fellow craft distillers. And what's going on in their world, basically? I like it. I can do that. Cool. Well, let's um, let's start with the beginning. So, where did it all start with, with Hobart whiskey? Oh shit! All right, um, we're going way back. Um, yep. We started setting up in 2014 and turned on the still in 2015. Um, we're a pretty small family-owned operation. It's basically just myself and our our distiller Ben James who. Basically, Ben basically does everything on the floor. So all the mashing, all the distillation, all the cask movements. And um, my job right. is just uh, sitting in my office and, and tasting and uh, being on the phone a lot. Um, quite small, though. Always intended to be quite small. Uh, the owner is a great guy. He just basically uh, wanted something 
He's got got a couple of different businesses, but he wanted something just a bit more fun and interesting that you know might be able to hand down to his to his kids one day. Uh, so that's how the distillery was born. Um, because of that, we don't really have pressure to get whiskey out the door, which is quite nice. He knows that it takes time and he's happy for us just to make sure every bottle we put out is just absolutely oh, up to the standard, exactly what we want. Um, it gives us total freedom, total control. Um, I run it like it's my own distillery. I spend his money like it's my own money and um, <laughs> you know, just, you know, have a bit of fun with it. Yeah, nice, nice. And, and with your... Um... When you, when you started, um, so you're there right from the start, right? And Ben was yeah. there right from the start. Uh, ben wasn't. No, so he came on board a few years ago, I think 2018. Maybe right. 2017, I've got a terrible sense of time. Uh, we had another guy uh, who set it up uh, with us uh, back in 2014, 2015, and he did a lot of the early distillation, but also was just sort of on, on board for consulting and, and getting things up and running. Yep. Yeah, okay. Understand. So when you when you started, what what was the um, what was the direction that, that you went? You know, from a like from a barrel perspective, from a a, a mash yep. perspective. Was there any was it a lead or, or was it uh, no? This is what we want to do. This is the road we want to go down. Uh, look, I still sort of I still feel like we're um. We're still trying to work out what we're doing. We're still learning. We're still still young in the industry, or you know, in, in total. Um, when we started, so you know, we were one of the maybe the first dozen Tasmanian distilleries, uh, but we flew under the radar for quite a while. Not many people knew what we were doing, how we were doing it. Um, early days, we were buying in wash from Mubri, a uh, local brewery. A lot of people probably know of Mubri, um, but pretty early on, we knew that yeah. we wanted do our own brewing on site just because we wanted that level of control for us it's much more just about you know telling the story and being able to put everything we can into this story in a bottle of whiskey um you know we're, we're even toying with the idea now seeing if it's possible to put down our own crop of barley so that we can actually have the story of going from paddock to bottle um mm. uh, but early days move through wash right. uh there was a lot of you know there's a lot of tasmanian and australian distilleries that uh already do a lot of heavy fortified cask maturation. So early days, we knew we wanted to do a lot of American oak bourbon, um, partially because it, it sort of fell outside of what everyone else is doing, but mainly because that's what we like and that's what we wanted to do. We, we love our bourbons. We love our American oak bourbon cask whiskies. Um, and so we're like, all right, we're going to take a stand. And just, we brought in quite a bit of wood uh, from the States back in the day, uh, which we've been, you know, coopering and working through now. And 90% um, of the bond store, I think, is expert and cask um beyond that i mean we're still just still just learning as we go um you know basically every week ben and myself sitting down and tasting casks or looking at stuff and making things more efficient finding ways to do things better just wanting to make a better product every time just do stuff better taste better whiskies uh it's just one of those things where we're just going to keep learning and learning yeah, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's um, I'm in the same sort of boat as you know. You know, small, and for me, it's sort of one cask at a time. Trying trying different casks, combination of fortifieds and local wines and and other things as well. And um, yeah, it's it's quite exciting, but it's there's a lot of unknowns when you go down that that sort of approach, isn't it? You, know, you lay a barrel and you go. Jesus, it's going to be a year or so before I know if, how this one's going along. That's right. Um, and even, you know, what we've found, you can have your best new make spirit, the best wood to put it into and the best conditions, and it still just might not work. It just, yeah. it's just the total gamble. Um, I mean, with our ex-bourbon route, we, we'd have a core range item, which is ex-bourbon matured whiskey, but we do a lot of experimental stuff. Um, and there's a lot of things here that we'll just never see the light of day. Um, what's your what's your weirdest experiment on the go at the moment? Uh, so, well, well <laughs> we've done a few. Um, we seasoned <laughs> a, a season to cast with rosé once um, just because we were going to distill the rosé and we're like, well, let's put it in the wood and see what happens. What came out? The rosé itself was absolutely fucking putrid. It was disgusting <laughs> when it came out, but uh, it made quite a floral, fruity whiskey, which was a little bit different. Um, we, we have a few fairly unique wine casks and that sort of stuff. Uh, right now, though, we're working on a, a series of beer casks. Um, so we're sort of treating now nice. 
a, a porter finish. It's been matured. It's been it's finished in the porter cask, and we have three others on the go. We've got mm. a stout, a red ale, and ginger beer. Um, and so we've been doing virtual tasting, sort of started through COVID, and we'll continue to do them into twenty one. Shoot, we're in twenty one already. Uh, this year, we'll I think it's probably around the end of March or April. We'll do another virtual and do these four beer casks. So, um, you know, a little bit left field. Not that, not that different i guess but different enough you, you can't be too different i mean yeah we, we do have some other stuff kicking around i mean we did a, a maple syrup cask in 2019 and you know why not just we're just having a bit of fun with it oh that'd be rich as it was sickly sweet it actually so it was for the winter feast in 2019 um cask strength i think it divided Cask strength, maple syrup cask. Ooh. We uh, we love our cask strength whiskey, so we do a lot of cask strength. Um, some people loved it because it was sickly sweet. Um, other people hated it because it was sickly sweet. Um, but if you ever see the bottle, pick it up because I would love to get another bottle. And you'll pay double. I probably would actually. We'll <laughs> be getting that one for a bargain now for double. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. So um, you mentioned doing um, uh, doing virtual tastings, mm. and um, if we if we all think about twenty twenty, um, twenty twenty obviously just changed the way we operate. Um, that was a, it was a very very testing time uh, for a lot of people, and they had to try different approaches to, to basically sell. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. So you were one of the early adopters. You, you embrace, embrace the, uh, the virtual tastings. Um, and I know because you, you sent me um, a set earlier in the piece and yeah, there were some really interesting samples in that, including the rosé cast that, that you yeah, got. So on. you might have actually gotten the very first one. Uh, I think the rosé yeah, right. was the first one we did. Um, the, the reason it was pretty easy for us to get onto it uh, is just because we'd been thinking about doing it for a while. Um, and then suddenly we had this engaged audience that couldn't leave their house. And we're like, yeah, now we can pin them. We can actually get them onto a virtual event. Yeah. Um, and it sort of just exploded. I think in one month we did 200 packs and we sold them out uh, in pretty record time. Um, and it's just a bit of fun for us. We we don't take it too seriously. I'm not sure if you've seen them. We sit up here on a panel. There's four of us here. Um, we sling so much shit at each other and the people in the audience because if you can't have fun doing this sort of stuff, then what are you doing it for? Yeah. Uh, the nights, you know, they can get on pretty pretty long. I think one night we didn't um, up the distillery until about 1 or 2 a.m. Um, so, <laughs> you know, they, they get, get a bit big sometimes, but it's just purely just fun and engaging with with people that, are, that appreciate whiskey and, you know, having a bit of fun. And you're getting good feedback off that? Oh, absolutely. If it, people are loving it, coming back for more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I only get good feedback because I just don't listen when it's bad feedback. I just, you know. <laughs> yeah, just, just always... turn it down when it happens, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It never actually happens though, does it? No, well, I couldn't tell you. because you know, yeah. That's it, never happens. <laughs> never happens, never heard of it. <laughs> How, how did um, how did how did everyone cope with COVID in Tassie? Because you know, a lot of the the industry there is reliant on tourism, aren't they? You know, with their their cellar doors, and there's um, there's a lot of distilleries, a lot of new distilleries uh, there as well. Mm. How, how, what was your take on on how it all evolved on in Tassie last year? Look, to be honest, we we weren't that greatly affected here. Um, yeah, we have a really nice space up here at the distillery, a nice bar and and tasting space, but we just don't. There's no cellar door, and we don't really do visitors at all. Um, so not much changed for us except that I couldn't go out drinking. Um, I mean, Tasmania <laughs> was probably affected pretty heavily by the lack of tourism. Um, other businesses would have surely been affected, but here personally, it was it was pretty smooth sailing for us. I mean. There was, you know, the bit of time where we were just putting out a bit of sanitizer to satisfy the market, um, but largely we just trucked on as usual. A lot of online orders um, and and just business as usual, really. 
Yeah, nice, nice. Okay. And and what would what was your um what was your take on talking to other distillers who did have cellar doors? Um, how did how did they adapt uh, over that period of time? Shit, mate, I actually don't know. I don't even know if I asked the question. I was probably just uh, <laughs> going golf with my own stuff. I don't even know if I asked how anyone else was going. It was sort of a bit of that funny time where I think everybody was feeling it, and um, you know, but nobody was really talking about it. All yeah. they were, and I just I wasn't asking the right questions um, because I mean the craft distillers we're all a bit of a tight knit group. We all get along. We all chat on Messenger. We all pick up the phone, talk to each other. Yeah. Um, but but to be fair as well, during COVID, I drank so much more than I ever had. So it's a fair fair <laughs> chance I just missed like a whole chunk of everything going on. Um, because I think that was a fairly common thing that we all got on the source. <laughs> yeah. Hence why I've run out of pretty well everything. I am. Um, I'm disappointed. I don't know how you can run out of whiskey. Like, is there no bottle shot within walking distance? You should always have that backup bottle. doesn't matter what it is. Just have the bottle there ready. Well, my last bottle was a, was a, a, a Brooklatic classic laddie. Mm. And I thought I had more left in it, but because of the, the teal bottle, I couldn't tell. I just, I just pour. I don't even pay attention to it. Gone. The weight wasn't a giveaway. No, no. I guess my biceps are just so strong oh, from all that drinking that I just, it doesn't even register. Yeah. Well, I mean, next time, just buy two bottles. And then when you kill the first one, go and buy another bottle. Indeed. Yep. Keep back up. It costs you the, the same amount in the long run because you're only buying one bottle. Look, these, these are rookie rookie mistakes you're making i'm a little bit disappointed to be honest well i will take instruction from the master well you're crafty crafty is a master <laughs> i do have a bit of a collection just a bit <laughs> yeah collection at home and a collection at the shed mm -hmm. yeah, I, am, yeah. I try to collect bottles and i justify buying really nice expensive bottles with my wife by telling her they'll go up in value we'll keep them i just drink them i don't buy them to collect i just buy them to drink but yeah she's always pretty un unimpressed when i'm cracking you know good bottles of whiskey that could potentially be worth money but you know everything's yeah. worth if you keep it one day she'll if, if call it's it worth a lot of money then it's probably going to taste good so yeah yeah, well, yeah, but it's makes it hard to not for, open it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Price, price is one of those subjective things, I guess. Um, you can you can get some absolutely banger whiskeys for you know eighty bucks, hundred bucks. And what I'll would be them. your go-to bargain whiskey? Um, oh, um, I I'm a big a bit of bit of a peat head, so I love the Ardbeg Ten. That's probably my go-to. Um, mm. But to be fair, I don't drink a lot of it anymore. I love the core of Reckon. I just live on hard big core of Reckon. Very nice. Yeah. Hmm. So we've got actually got a question coming from Facebook, yeah. um, which kind of answered earlier, I think just before David uh, Taylor came in, um, uh, along the lines of the different casks uh, that you're doing. Um, he says Adams are doing a Kahlua. I've, I've heard about that. They put it out already, didn't they? Wasn't it a part of the um, the single malt whiskey club? I I heard. Look, I love the Adams guys, but the thought of that absolutely repulsed me. Um, but then other people told me it was amazing. So if anybody's got a sample, feel free to flick it my way. Um, I'm really interested to try it because the amount of sugars and sweetness that you would get from that would be insane. Mm. Uh, look, I I had a. I was out the other day and, and uh, there was nothing really to drink and I had a, a Kahlua and I haven't had a Kahlua in, in <laughs> since my teenage years, I think. But no um, more than 20 years. Really yeah, yeah, yeah. And the rest, and the rest. And, oh, my God, was it a shock to the system. So, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that Kahlua. Um, Kahlua Probably better than Maduri. Um. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, it does take me back. I haven't had any clue for a long, long time. But uh, yeah, I just, I mean, what did they do with the Kahlua after they seasoned the cask as well? What would you do with it? You, you just, Down the drain? Yeah, well, <laughs> I 
but I mean, it would have, would have been a fair fair amount of Kahlua. I mean, it's probably what, like 30 bucks a bottle now. Probably used a good 10 bottles. I suppose it's not that much, but yeah. I'll, um, I'll have yeah, to just a sample. They're, they're big into rolling the barrels around, though, the Adams, aren't they? That, that's right, yeah. The, yeah. So, yeah, pr probably probably 20 litres and keep rolling it around. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was a small cask. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I'd be keen to try it. That sort of stuff really interests me because uh, I guess we have the flexibility in Australia to do basically anything we like when it comes to casks and wood. Um, you know, there's yeah. been a few different different wood types coming out, hasn't there? So there's a red gum from Old Kempton, uh, the Jarrah from, I forgot where the Jarrah was from recently. Um, yeah. Jarrah, Jarrah, Jarrah. I think even... No, uh, can't when, recall. When I went to Sullivan's Cove, I think they said they had a few, couple of different wood types there as well. You know, so yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Right. How do you go with your wood, mate, and sourcing your wood? Because you're you're producing quite a bit now. Um, you got a good supply of wood. Uh, no, no problem with the wood. Mm -hmm. No, the wood's the wood's strong and steady. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> um, look, when when we started up, we dropped a couple of containers of wood into Tasmania, um, which has kept us going. We just get them done as we need them and and fill them up. Right. Um, it's just as when we started up, there was. One Cooperage in Tasmania, that was Tasmanian Cast Company. Uh, yep. There's been a few other people into the market, which has been great because it just means more supply, more accessibility, uh, and more choice. Um, we're not we're not at the point where we need to consistently buy casks at the moment. We just sort of pick and choose what we want um, until we fill up everything we've got, which we're probably not that far away. Probably three or four months, we'll fill up the rest of our wood supply. Um, but I'm pretty confident wood won't be too much of an issue. How do you go with a crafty? Do you have any issues finding wood up there? Uh, no. We have, I'm, we I'm, have I'm, issues filling our wood. <laughs> I, have, I have issues what? Getting our wood filled. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, have, a, uh, I have a bit of a tendency to, um, if, if I see something I like, I'll, I'll go and buy it and uh, won't necessarily use it straight away, yeah. which is a bit, a bit of a... Bit of a Tim Duckett thing, I think. You know, he, he, he does a bit of the old barrel banking, doesn't he? Tim yeah. Duckett. He's well, all, I think he, it's the only way to be, though. That way you can sort of buy stuff that really piques your interest or it's, you know, genuine casts or really interesting casts. Yeah. Um, and you will fill it. I mean, if you store it properly, it'll last for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, yeah, the condition of the wood. Yeah, that's something you've always got to look at, as you just said, um, yeah. and maintaining it and tighten those hoops before you fill it, that's for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, um, with Ben on the floor by himself, pretty much, he, he was doing a lot of that before he filled them, but we basically now just send them off to be handled because it's just so much work trying to get casks that are tight um, as opposed to just sending them to a cooper. They tighten them up, they might toast them, they might char them, uh, they pressure test them, bring them back, and we fill them up. So yeah. it saves a lot of time on the floor here for sure. Yeah, it cut down the risks too, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. What sort it was um, Applewood, that Apple. was Applewood Distillery, who did the Jarrah cask. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm. As the their, uh, their debut. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Backwoods are doing Red Gums as well. Yeah. Backwoods Distillery, yeah, they're, they're on Red Gums. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. Um, I don't know, I guess nobody really knows how to go and... You know, the thing is, a couple of people might do it, but that's not really indicative of how it will go in a wider, mm. wider use. But yeah, well, I, I remember chatting with um, Andrew Young, uh, Wyan Cooperage. He was very adamant that most Australian woods are rubbish to use. Um, from a Cooper's perspective, that's that's quite interesting. Um, I guess we um, we have to do a bit of experimentation here with cask finishes, but. We're a little bit traditionalist in the sense that, you know, I believe, you know, Scots have been using oak for so long that they must be using oak for some reason. Um, but that's not to say that we wouldn't do a different different wood type to try it. I guess it might be a trap if a new distillery come on board and was like, yep, I'm going to fill everything in red gum. That's all we're doing. Uh, but, you know, I guess everything that's going on at the moment is smaller scale and a bit experimental. And it sort of comes back to the story as well. 
if you do something like that with conviction and it makes a whiskey, it doesn't have to be the best whiskey in the world. If you can go out there and sell people and, you know, be proud of it and trying something different and it's still a good whiskey, then people will buy it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, people want to, they want to know the background. They want to know the story behind it, the people behind it. And, mm. and that's, yeah, for us, that, that's an integral part of what we do. We, you know, we store, yeah, whoop, lost it. <laughs> 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 don't touch anything <laughs> i'm tucked away in a little corner here i've got a little stand <laughs> it's <laughs> john Just as you so. said yeah, I, I, it expertise no not at all <laughs> yeah yeah that's, that's that's why luke's here yeah <laughs> yeah all right moving on moving on uh so with you john and with and with hobart whiskey where where do you reckon you learnt learnt the craft from? Was it um, well? You, yeah, you tell me. Where where did you learn the, your craft from? Um, well, just sort of trial and error. Uh, so when yeah. we were starting out, there wasn't wasn't as much information available. There wasn't a heap of people doing it in Tasmania. Um, but the best thing about this industry is that everybody's completely open and happy to help. So. Um, you know, early days, we, we spoke to people like Dean Jackson and Patrick McGuire and, and Bill Lark, Mark Nicholson, just everybody went around, did the rounds, chatted to people, learnt what we were doing. Yep. Um, I still think that we, well, I know for a fact we've come a long way from our first distillate to what we're doing now. Um, yeah. Our palates are getting better. We know more about what we want and just our processes are better. Uh, so when we started up, we... Um, sort of looked around and we didn't feel like we had to spend all this money on brand new shiny equipment, new fermenters, you know, a new mash tun. And we sort of just made do with, with what we could get. So we are in an old egg factory. So we had access to dairy vessels that were here. Um, yep. you know, Rocky has a farm. We, you know, salvage things from up there. Uh, the one thing we put money into the still, that was very important. Just the crown jewel of the distillery. We only have one still. We do our wash and our spirit on the same still. Um, but, you know, it was only maybe in the last 12 to 18 months we actually got a, a new boiler system for our hot water for our brewing. Um, we picked up a couple of fermenters from another local distillery who didn't want them. Um, prior to that, we were distilling in IBCs. We were, you know, <laughs> mashing with hot water. But it was really hard just to keep everything exactly where we wanted. So uh, we're just learning as we go. Um, it's part of the fun for us. It's part of the story. And, and just, you know, you can just see the differences as we go. I never feel like we've made bad spirit, but it's just better. And all we want to try and do now is just make sure every time we do a spirit run, every time we pull a, pull a cask sample or put it in a bottle, it's better, it's on par or better than everything else we've done so far. Um, the learning doesn't end. We, we talk to other people in the industry. We go around distilleries. Um, every chance I get when I go to the mainland, I try and visit distilleries. My wife gets absolutely fed up with it because all I want to do is go to distilleries. But uh, it's just, it's not hard to learn in this industry because it's such a phenomenally fun industry as well. I agree, I agree. It, it's a very open industry. And uh, yeah, that, you know, when, when I got into the industry, um, I learned from various peoples uh, who, various distillers, and they became my mentors and um you know i remember them telling me uh, at the time they said you know someday someone will talk to you and they'll, they'll ask for advice and we go why would they ask for advice from me but uh, <laughs> they do so <laughs> maybe maybe they're just learning you know like what not to do no I mean. <laughs> <laughs> We're shooting the shit, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot of lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes you make on the way. That's for sure. Uh, but look, <laughs> the thing is, like same with us. But if you can identify them and learn from them, then what does it matter? Yeah. Uh, when I was when I answered your question just then, to be honest, halfway through I forgot what your question was, so I'm not sure if I answered it entirely. Um, sometimes I have this thing where I just talk and I forget to stop talking. So feel free just to cut in and tell me to get back on track. I you. think you answered it. <laughs> Whatever the question was. <laughs> yeah, talk, talking about doing things wrong. Um, you know, one of one of my early mistakes, simple mistake, is um, just stenciling a barrel, mm. right? And and you um, and I got a branding iron, 
And uh, I thought, how cool is it a branding iron? You know, you can brand every every single barrel. Yeah. And after about the, I don't know, about the 10th barrel, I realised that uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the wood surface is different. It's un uneven. So branding iron just sits on a shelf and does nothing. Yeah. But uh, stenciling barrels, I still get it wrong sometimes where <laughs> – I'll stencil it and then I'll, you know, it, it, you'll fill it and you go, oh, fuck, stencil's on the side. Or, <laughs> yeah, it's just. <laughs> so if you're OCD, yeah, you don't come to my shed, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, so I had a similar thought. We, um, we got a branding iron. It just did not work at all. Like it was yeah. just, and, and the thought of having open flames here doesn't really excite me too much. Um, but we we don't have a stencil either. Like to be honest, we just we have sharpies and we just write on our casks now. Uh, we're we're pretty simple and primitive down here, but it gets a, it gets the job done. Um, I should I should look into a stencil. I've thought about getting a stencil for a long time, but you know, not a priority. What is your priority? What do you want? What do you want to do going forward? Oh, oh shit! I don't know. This is I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> um, um, I, I honestly don't know. So, just keep just, on keeping on. Just, just keep on, keep on trucking. We um, in twenty twenty, we only did two limited releases outside of launching our core range. So, we've got a lot more releases here. We want to get out, but you know, obviously, got to make sure they're ready. Um, yeah. Just for us, especially, it's just about getting out there and talking to people and introducing new people to our product that might not have tried it. Um, we're pretty happy with it, um, but yeah, just just growth, I guess. But steady growth, not not phenomenal, you know, not crazy growth. We're not, we don't want that, and we wouldn't be ready for it. But just nice, steady growth of the distillery. Yeah, right. Which, as you know, having a distillery costs so much fucking money. Um, yep. Run. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's it for us. Just be healthy, put our products we love. That's just purely what we want from the distillery. Yeah, nice, nice. And you've got a signature now, haven't you? You've got the, the signature whiskey, which is your yeah, the, I don't, the core range. Yeah, so core range item. Um, so the problem, I don't know if you have come across this or you will, but, um, you know, we, we're putting out limited bottling. So it might be 200 bottles, 500 bottles. Just one batch goes out. We sell it out. doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, I got sick of this problem where bars and bottle shops would ring me up and be like, John, I need another case of this whiskey. And I'd look and it would be like, we hadn't had it for six months. Uh, it's like, well, we don't have it anymore. Restaurants, bars don't necessarily want to change their menu to stay with limited releases. Um, bottle shops are generally pretty busy and just want to get product in and out the door. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's great. That's not a bad thing. Um, so... I come up with this concept to make a core range item. We're, we're, they're still very small batches compared to any core range item. I think our last batch, we did three, we've done three batches in the last six months. And I think our last one was only 200 and something bottles. Yeah. Um, but it's just more about making sure we've got a constant supply of this American Oak X bourbon. Um, we still cut it to between <coughs> 49, just depending where it drinks best. Um, I wasn't able to just sort of commit and say, we're going to cut everything to, to you know, 46 or 48 or whatever it may be, um, just because we wanted to maintain that craft aspect. And we feel that even half a percent difference in a whiskey can change a whiskey a lot. So it's about, it just is about our ethos, putting out whiskey that drinks the best that it can, how we want to drink it and how we appreciate it. So um, that's been going really well, just sort of rolling that out Australia wide because, it's just always there. It doesn't matter, you know, whether whether you've had it for six months or, or three years by the time we get to that point, it will be there and be available. Even and how do you handle the point. consistency? Yeah, good question. Um, I was going to ask that. Yeah. yeah, maintaining consistency over that period of time and that many bottles and that many batches. Mm. Um, how do you actually do that? <laughs> we just do it. <laughs> we, just it. We, um, we, we know we generally know the flavor profile we're going to get out of certain casks we have here um we've got a bit of a process for you know we decant these and we do this with them and then do that and we get to you know the, the next point um it's sort of funny because batch one of our signature uh ben and myself absolutely loved it we're like this is great this is an easy drink it's so so rich but light and you sit down and drink half a bottle 
which is what we wanted. We want an easy drinker at a bar for people that might want to try an Australian whiskey, uh, can pick it up and not drink it. Go, oh, fuck, you know, what is this? You know, like if you introduce somebody to a Hartwood as their first Aussie whiskey, the, you'd just you'd put them off Australian whiskey forever, probably, maybe. Um, just <laughs> so rich and so, so, so alcoholic, you know, there's so much in it. Uh, so we wanted something really light and easy to drink, but plenty of character. Batch one, we thought it was amazing. Batch two was even better. We're like, wow, what are we doing? You know, we've got batch two and it's even better than the first one. This is this is great. Let's see if we can go. Batch three, look, I, I'm normally quite humble, but it was really good and it is really good. We're down to the last, you know, a couple of dozen bottles, but um, just loved it. And it just, I think because of how we're doing it, we're, we're generally not decanting as much as we have coming online. But as batches grow, we're not going to have to, go to younger spirit we will always sort of have that spirit that's maturing a bit further and and developing a bit more character than the last batch um right as for blending it to be the same well we just you know we know what we're going to get and we just work towards it and we just we taste a lot and we nose a lot and we just write notes and we you know there's days where we'll just sit here in an afternoon that goes into night where we just just work away on it it's a joy <laughs> Not a chore, is it? <laughs> That's right, absolutely. Um, I mean, palate fatigue is a real thing, and sometimes you sit there. And the problem is with just Ben and myself here, um, we don't really have a like a tasting panel or people we can bounce ideas off or you know samples. But um, we we do a fair bit in the industry, so I'll go and talk to people I know, hand them a sample, unlabeled bottle, you know, like take this away, tell me what you think, give me some tasting notes, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, Whereas I know it's got some faults or I know it might, you know, have X, Y, Z, but I like to see if they can pick it up because sometimes I get worried that it's just, you know, Ben and myself are so close to it that we're just, we sort of get in our own heads a little bit and it yep. sort of get, I don't know if it happens with you where you just, you, oh, yes. you don't know, <laughs> you're like, wow, this whiskey is really good or wow, this whiskey is really not good, but yep. you just don't know if you're having a bad day or you've just, you're just not in the right frame of mind. Whiskey for me, even drinking whiskey is very much a mood thing. The type yeah. of whiskey I drink will be based on my mood. So, mm. um, totally agree. Totally agree. A frame of mind thing. Um, when we did first release um, last year, at one stage we were uh, Todd and I. We were absolutely. This is it. This is where we want to go. And then something changed now bear in mind at this stage everything was still in the barrels so and you know what it's like john you taste something in a barrel compare it to what's actually in a bottle it's a totally different animal it's uh and that in itself is an art form isn't it knowing how to interpret what is in a barrel and how you think it's going to behave in a bottle but we actually pulled back because frame of mind was was not right it was it wasn't tasting how we how we thought it was tasting so it's um it's a, it's a challenging thing, isn't it? It really is a challenging thing. And you can see why, you know, the, a lot of the Sc Scottish distilleries have been doing it for, for eons. And uh, there's, there's, it's an absolute art form. Distilling is, well, my opinion, distilling is one thing, brewing is another thing, but actually pulling it out of a barrel and going, yes, this is going in a bottle and this is going to be a good whiskey. That's that's a different thing. Right, absolutely. And um you know, we we tend to take a very slow process from decanting through to the bottle. Um, you know, I, the industry is great for this because we can bounce it off other people. We can bring people in to try different samples and I'll listen to all of the advice that we get. And, you know, like any advice, we pick and choose what's relevant and what we want to do. Um, yep. But quite often we'll decant a cask, we'll give it some air, we'll stir it up, we, you know, might, might treat it, might give it some heat, might put it in the cool, just something like that. Uh, we also do a lot just based on gut feeling, um, which tends, it seems to have worked so far. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes you'll find a cask, you'll taste it and be like, it's not over tannin, it's got to come out. Let's do something else with it. Let's do this, let's do that. Um, yep. Similar to treatment when we get it out of the cask, we'll, we'll just treat it how we think it should be. Um, we'll cut it to where we want it. We'll put it in the bottles and we'll sit on those bottles for weeks and then we'll crack one open, we'll try it. Um, so far, once it's gone in the bottle, we haven't had to get rid of it, like decant it out of the bottles. Um, but there's been a few instances where we've gotten a cask out because we've thought it's really good and been ready, 
treated it and just not been able to get it to where we want. So it's like, all right, what do we do now? Let's buy another cask, put that back in and just let's just sit on that for a while. Yeah. Um, it's not always about, you know, spirit age or, or character or, any, or anything like that. Sometimes they just don't tick the boxes you want. And we don't necessarily know what our boxes are. We don't have a list of things to check off. We just know that it's just not ready or it's just not right. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, year, years ago, I, I did the, um, uh, the Tassie Whiskey Academy mm-hmm. uh, with, with Anne. Yep. A- and there was a guy from, he was ex Diageo. And um, I can't remember if, if it was myself or someone else asked the question, but they said, uh, what do you, how do you know when you've got a really good cask? What do you, what do, you do with it? And if you have, a cask which is substandard, what do you do with it? And he said, we'll never know. We go, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, he says, you know, take a 12 year old, for example, we'll go out into, into the racks and we'll go, they're all ready, they're all done. We'll drop them all in, into a vessel and boom, mix it together and, and that's what it is. And he go, but you, you could have an exceptionally, you know, world-class cask. Mm-hmm. Yep, and you could have an absolutely shit cask. Yeah. So craft distillers don't do that. Don't have that that approach. Obviously, because they don't have the volume. So it's uh, yeah, it's a challenge for the uh, smaller end of town, isn't it? Yeah. It also, I guess, is what makes our what we're doing so unique. The fact yeah. that you know, today we did a bit of a just a bond store audit, just check some cars, check some dates, see what was going on. Um, and you know, I could go and pull two samples from two identical casks that were filled on the same day with the same new make spirit. And they'll be yep, completely yep. different. Um, yep. And that's, you know, and then I guess that's what makes this job and what we do so interesting. The fact that we sit there and then say, well, I really like this one because of X, Y, Z. And I like this one because of ABC, which one's going to be better in the market. What will other people enjoy? Cause it's not always about us. It's mostly about us and what we like. And that's what we work towards, which makes it really easy. Um, but you know, by just decanting a whole layer of a distillery bond store, it's just it's sort of a little bit depressing because there would be some absolute stunners in there, and it's just yep. going, it's just just disappearing into the mass of whiskey. Um, but you know, it's just chalk and cheese, really, the craft industry versus that that big commercial operation. Yep, different approaches, different approaches. So. Scotland or America, from a um, from an influence standpoint, from what you follow, what you're interested in overseas, would you say you're more uh, a Scotchify or, or an Americanify? Probably Scotchify, I reckon. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I guess it's just because I have a bigger connection with Scotch because I drink a lot more Scotch than I do American whiskey or bourbon. It's right. Drink- used to drink a bit of bourbon back in the day, but largely now it's all just single malt and, and scotch. Um, but, you know, we're, we're sort of running our own race. I mean, we're, we're sort of just doing, doing what we want. You know, maybe one day, you know, well, one day they will. Someone, someone in the States will be like, are you, are you Scotchified or Australianified? That's going to be our goal, where we can actually set a new, you know, we're making what, the rules for this. What, what will be the definition, do you think, of Australianified? What will make an Australian whiskey stand right, out? So we're, um, we're shooting the shit, aren't we? So tiny casks, really woody and over tannined, and two years and one day. <laughs> <laughs> so say some. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, though. I mean, what, what makes our whiskey? better than everybody else's or you know on par what what is it is it the different, different to everyone else's probably the word i think different yeah yeah that's that's better yeah yeah um, is it something in the tasmanian water um i don't think so since we filter 90 percent of our water <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know is it the barley is it the grains is it um the environment i guess all these things contribute uh but i, I guess maybe the climate's maybe one of the biggest things in so, terms of stability of temperature or uh, the fluctuations the from fluctuations more yeah right compared to scotland i mean i've never been to scotland but i, I imagine i think it's just like cold and dreary all the time is that right so uh, I, I got sunburned there once 
<laughs> Only yeah. one so. Yeah. yeah. Um, the sun broke through the clouds one day. <laughs> How long were you there for? Like six years? Yeah, yeah, no, it was only a couple of weeks. A <laughs> couple of couple of trips. Been there twice. <laughs> yeah, no, interesting place. So yeah, your your um your bond store. Uh, just looking at it behind. So from a from a temperature variation standpoint, you must get a fair bit of. Uh, Variation summer winter with your barrels and and even even within a day and an evening. Would, oh, absolutely! Um, yeah. Enough high in the rack, um, so we we sort of have this uh, pr program where we rotate the bottom of the rack through to the top and bring it back down. Wow! I think we've done it once in like five years. Um, <laughs> but you know, up here in this this level that I'm on now, it gets really hot in summer, like almost unbearably hot. So the top layer of casks definitely get a lot, a lot more heat than the others. Um, we, you know, it's just one of those things where it it, it adds character, right? Um, yeah. I went to a bond store uh, a few weeks ago, and it was, I don't know if other people might know it. It was it's sort of underground and very tight and very, very cool and very temperate. And they make some of my favourite whiskey in Tasmania. So um, that works for them. This this seems to be working for us but we do get pretty wild fluctuations in here. Um, you know, also just a lot of draft and a lot of dust, but it works and surely that all adds to the character as well. The dust, all the dust. <laughs> yeah, I know what the dust is like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you expanded, didn't you? Didn't you expand your distillery so you didn't have to brew off the trailer anymore or? Uh, I'm still on the trailer at this stage, but yeah. So I, I went from 60 squares to 120 squares. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it was pure luxury. <laughs> um, see, we're, we're sort of working on a second bond store now. Um, right. Even though we could probably fit a bit more in here, it's more just about risk minimization, I guess, risk of catastrophic failure. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I can't imagine how you can work in such a small space because your bond store in that as well yeah that's the bond store as well that's, that's <laughs> so, our entire existence in this one little spot we are small we are small john <laughs> nothing nothing wrong with that though i mean look we're we're still quite small compared to other tasmanian distilleries and even some other craft distilleries but it works for us um, yeah it's, manageable. it's nice you know it, it's good that it's just been on myself here largely doing the operations and management of the distillery because it means at any time either of us know exactly what's going on and what's in the bond store and what we're working towards. That's a pretty lean operation, mate, for the amount of bar barrels you got behind you there. That's a very lean operation. Oh, I cracked the whip pretty hard. So On yourself? Uh, everyone involved. My wife works here as well part-time doing all the logistics and packing and labelling. So. Um, we're, we're all pretty committed, which means we all work pretty well and efficiently to, to get done. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, like running the still, sometimes you'll just be watching it do nothing. Like you're just, you're just waiting. It's a waiting game. So yep. it, it, I find it quite a, you know, peaceful, uh, slowish industry in that sense where you just, you take your time with it. You run the still, you do the brew and um, yeah, it, it's manageable, I think. What's your approach for the uh, the actual distilling process? Are you a uh, uh, keep it low and slow, or you uh, yeah, generally, speed it up a bit? Or... We uh, normally, you know, heat up the still, you know, just sort of get it up to temp a bit quicker. Um, but then we we run it very slow, um, quite narrow cuts, uh, and just we we get probably a pretty small yield compared to what we could but it's just about making sure we get like that really light fruity fruity part of the, the hearts run of the spirit run uh, for what we're doing uh, we're not in any hurry um we have a full uh sort of electronic backboard behind us still so we schedule it to start up you know early morning so we get in and it's uh humming away step it back a little bit do the cuts and then sort of dump it at the end of the day and how much of that? How much of those cuts are you? How aggressive with those cuts are you generally? Uh, it varies. Um, ben Ben is all over it. Some days, 
look, and again, I think it comes back to mood a little bit. It depends on how he is, how he's feeling. Also, just what the run is like. Each run is different, even if yeah. it's the exact same mash bill. Um, some days, you know, he'll be in there collecting buckets of stuff that he's not entirely sure about compared to, you know, does he want to put it in or does he not? Uh, and he'll find it might go through a bit of a patch where he doesn't like what's coming off now, but then the next bit will will appreciate. So he watches it pretty closely, uh, which I'm grateful for because um, if it was me, I'd just for sure get distracted and, um, you know, probably just forget to do the cups at all. <laughs> It is a lot of just watching a pot boil. Mm-hmm. It's a very pretty pot. Oh, there's more to it than that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people... The cuts, the pro- once it comes out of the condenser and it's dripping into your little vessel there. I mean, for me, it's a little vessel, but yeah, it's uh... pulling little. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I should have set up in the in the still room. I, I'm not sure if it's a sharp on my cal- on my camera, but that's our still today. On its side with the elements being replaced. So, oh wow! So no operations today or tomorrow or maybe this week at all. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just one of those things that needs to happen. So that maybe. must use a lot of power to heat those elements. Um, yeah, I think our, our hydro bills are sort of like maybe ten grand a quarter. <sighs> wow. How big is still? Was that 1,800 litres, wasn't it? 1,800 litres, yeah. Yeah, and it's a nap lure? It is a nap lure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of his earlier designs, um, similar to the, you know, one of the first ones he made for Lark. Right. Mm, yeah. Um, it does the job. It runs pretty well. Um, it's had its fair share of issues, but what still doesn't, I think. Yeah, well, it's a piece of equipment, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's it. Do you use, how do you heat your steel? Is it direct fire or? <laughs> my, my, I wanted to go direct fire. And uh, the one condition my wife put on me was no naked flames. So, uh, <laughs> and I think she's right, uh, yeah. particularly in, in, in my we don't environment. Need that challenge. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, there's enough challenges. We don't, we don't, we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> there's, uh, I know of another Tasmanian distillery. Um, we went out there one day to visit him. He's running his still that's direct fire. And there's like a slow drip of like spirit coming down right next to the base. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's safe. <laughs> ah, it'll be right. <laughs> Living life dangerously. <laughs> Uh, mine's um, 970, uh, 30 kilowatts, John. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a bit smaller and my power bill, thank God, is a lot less than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I might have been exaggerating. I haven't looked at the power bill for a while. Um, maybe it's not quite that much. It's a lot, though. I know it's a lot. I don't think yeah. that's far off. But we don't we don't run it around the clock either. We um, Yeah, I mean, we only sort of run it three to five times a week. So no no weekend work for us, no night shifts. It's just, you know, uh, we wanted to make, with just Ben and myself, it's just more about, um, you know, it's sort of like a nine to five job, really. And that's what we wanted. We didn't want to have to do the night shift and, and weekend work if we could help it. But it means you, if when you, yeah, not if, but when you do expand, you've got the capacity there. You can switch it on quite easily. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Mm. And obviously, I'm sorry. That that's obviously worked well enough for you, given the number of barrels you've got sitting behind you there. Yeah, so I think we're um, I think we're sitting on about forty thousand liters at the moment. Nice. Wow. Um, yeah, it'll take some time. There's a lot of last. There's a lot of large casks here. Um, we're only filling hundreds and bigger now, um, and pretty much once we deplete all our hundred liter. Woodstock will probably go two hundreds and bigger, um, because for us it's just there's no rush on it. Um, I don't know if you've seen just down there on the floor. I've got a couple of really old port pipes, six hundred and fifty liter port pipes. Um, yeah, they're they're probably going to take you know ten fifteen years, but there's just no rush. Uh, some other distillers come in. They're like, John, you're crazy. You should cut them back into small casks, but. You know, there's so much history in these casks and they're a thing of beauty. So we'll just wait it out and see what happens. 
a serious commitment for 15 years. <laughs> well, I, I didn't consider at the time, though, but it was actually about uh, five weeks' worth of production just to fill them up. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. But a, a little side project. Yeah, that's it. They'll be ready for Rocky's sons, <laughs> probably. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I also didn't really consider the... Um, the investment tied up there. Like that's a lot of whiskey to put down in two casks. But you know, we can we can say we've got two big old genuine port pipes. So, you know, like that that works for us. Absolutely. There's plenty of difference. And when you do eventually crack them open, uh gosh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out. Yeah, that's right. Um one of my favorite whiskies is the Ben Riak port pipe. So yeah, that's um Something to aspire to. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'd love to, love to see them. Uh, just as the scale of all of that. Well, you'll have to come down. Just come and visit. Definitely. And that, now you can. Now we can. Now, now the restrictions are, are open. You can, you can. Finally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. And once once the international borders open up, John, you got any? Any plans to head overseas, do any research or uh, anything um, like that? No. So my wife isn't a good flyer. Um, and also traveling costs time and money, which is two things that I'm poor of. Um, so right. <laughs> I'll, um, look, I'll be happy just to get back up to New South Wales or Victoria. Um, I'm, I'm getting yeah. a little bit you know, homesick just being in Tasmania, being in Hobart, but no, no travel planned. We we're sort of homebodies, my wife and I. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd ever have the chance to leave Australia, and, and I don't really want to at the moment. I don't think it's the right time to be travelling around the world anyway. Uh, no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I think the US is the last place you'd want to go right now, too, isn't it? That's right. Absolutely. So when you come uh, to uh, New South Wales, is there something that you're keen to check out that you haven't seen before? I just want to do the Oak Barrel Whiskey Fair again. That's the main reason I want to come up. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was, that good was the last. That was, you know, one of the best events I've ever done. Um, so, Scotty, if you're watching this, don't forget me. Um, I don't, look, part of the problem is when I go even to Sydney or Melbourne, I don't normally drive because normally I'm on the source while I'm there. Uh, and with, that means I'm sort of confined to smaller spaces. Um, most of my stops are bar related and, and you know, inner city distilleries, like the Starwood when I went to um, Victoria, Archie Rose, that sort of stuff. But yeah. I, I just sort of want to go out and talk to people and see things and drink stuff and eat food and just, just you know, have a bit of fun with it. Nothing specific. Shoot though. the shit. Shoot the shit, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, shoot the shit. Yes, no, true. Yeah, the, the, the Oak Barrel Whiskey Fair uh, 2019, it was, wasn't yeah. it? When you, when you were up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, it would have been. Um, it was just so much fun. The audience was great and engaged and interested in what we were saying. And it was just so much fun. Yeah. So if, if I don't get in as an exhibitor, I'll be going up as a, as a punter for sure anyway if it happens this year. Well, it's, it's, um, it's a thing on the, on the, yeah, it's a thing on the Sydney calendar that that's for sure. Mm. And, you know, over the years with the, with the Oak Barrel, the whiskey fair, it used to be, oh, when I first started going, it was like 90% um, Scotch and, and American and yeah, very, very small percentage of Australians. And, it's just grown over the years. And, you know, the, the 2019 one, it was basically one side the rest of the world and the other side was Australia, wasn't it? We, yeah. we, we had, had half the hall. Well, to be honest, I still didn't really even get and to the event there. I was just sort of talking and presenting and serving whiskey. And um, I was mainly just on the yeah. Australian side anyway. So I thought most of it was Australian um, just because that's where, where it was. Um, but I'm definitely keen to go again and, you know, to spend a bit more time doing the rounds and, and seeing a bit more like that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's good. It was good. We all look forward to that. 
Mm. Right, now, well, I'm going to take the last of my rum, which I'm enjoying. You go, Luke. You were about to say something, mate. I cut, cut you off. Oh, I, um, I was just wondering, what does, the, uh, what does your whiskey add to your chili jam? Uh, generally a bit of whiskey flavour and a bit of oak. <laughs> um, look at um, it, all of the alcohol gets burnt off, so it's a non-alcoholic product. Um, but it, it just it basically tastes like Hobart whiskey with chilli jam. Mm. Not that different than just getting some chilli jam and tipping in some Hobart whiskey, but we've done the hard part for you. <laughs> I'm disappointed you haven't tried it. You should have, you know... If you're serious about this interview, you probably should have bought a few of my products. <laughs> it's, it's, the... I... it's called research. <laughs> it's called pre-warning. Mm. <laughs> I'm definitely going to buy some though, 100%. That looks fantastic. Yeah, Plus, the water, your, the water's been your placed for one beans. of your signature models. So. <laughs> yeah, and also the, nice. also the also uh, the the coffee beans. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's a good one for you too, isn't it? Yeah, it's something a little bit different. Um, I love coffee and I love my coffee roaster. So I was like, let's do a bit of a collaboration. Um, we we did the first batch and uh, we covered the ones that... So we we did two coffee bean types. We did the Brazil and the Colombia. Uh, found the perfect yeah. ratio that we thought drank the best with them. Uh, the ones that had the lower end of the ratio, we covered in chocolate, which have gone really well. The whole, the whole thing has, has gone really well. I haven't had to push it too hard and people have, you know, loved it and appreciated it, the ones that I've spoken to. Um, and again, just something a little bit different because we're quite small. We can, you know, Rocky and myself can quite often just talk on the phone and have an idea. It's like, yes, let's do this. And we'll just go and do it. We don't have people we have to bounce it off and do market research or a board or anything like that. We can just, we can action stuff pretty quickly just based on, on what we think will work or what we want to do. So... Coffee beans is one of those things. Um, definitely working, we need to be working on another batch now. Um, but, you know, it, it's just not a priority because it's more just a bit of fun, bit of, you know, a um, bit of a collaboration. Yeah, something, something a bit different and, uh, yeah. yeah, popular. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm, uh, I think I'm pretty well um, done with questions. Questions. <laughs> Should... <laughs> I'm, I'm... Not interview. I'm, I'm pretty well out now, John. <laughs> that one rum has really got your head, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it has, mate. It has. Your camera, mate, been, you I'm... can't talk. Oh, look, I've been battling Telstra all day with uh, MBN, and it's just been doing my head in. I'm just fried. <laughs> I, I thought you were fried. a bit worn out there, so yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> Uh, Telstra will frazzle absolutely anyone. Oh, just the different people you talk to, the different ways you talk to them, and it's a new conversation every time. And, uh, yeah, you, your MBN technician turns up without the equipment, and then the Telstra technician turns up, and the MBN hasn't been and done what he needs to do. It's like, oh, my God. Anyway, that's my world. That's my world today. <laughs> so, John, were you a, did you do any sort of home distilling before – before you got into the world of distilling? No, not at all. Um, so I met Rocky quite a few years ago on a different project entirely. And at that point, he was he told me he was going to start up a distillery. Did I want to see the site? I was like, of course, I do want to check it out. Um, the opportunity was there, so I sunk my claws in. Um, my background is actually graphic design and marketing. Um, right. Turned business. Um, and, yeah, so I sort of come on board and I had great intentions to do, you know, all of the operations, all of the management stuff, plus, um, you know, work with Rocky across all of his other businesses as well. Well, um, you know, just, I, we didn't, that didn't work. I just didn't have enough hours in the day to make that work. Uh, so, you know, that's where we had uh, the other distiller when we started up. Uh, his name was Brian uh, and Ben. So, um, look, on the tools, I'm actually a bit shit. I know how to do it. I know what I'm doing. Um, but I, I largely fully trust Ben and leave everything to him for that. And um, I just do all the other bits and pieces. But, yeah, no, I, I'm not a good distiller. I'm happy to say that. Nothing wrong with that. Mm. Yep. I've, I've Honestly, dabbled... it gets you a long way. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I've dabbled myself and it's as... as uh, 
as Crafty said, is certainly an art form and that mm. requires a lot of patience and practice and attention and luck. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's a bit of luck in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. Like Ben lives and breathes this and he, he loves it. So um, I'm happy for him to just handle all of that stuff because he's so good at it. Uh, and then I'll just do the other bits and pieces like tasting. The important stuff like tasting, yeah. Tasting, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we did have on Facebook uh, a shout out uh, from Danny saying that if you need any volunteers to uh, help with your tasting panels, mm-hmm. yeah. um, he'd be willing to, to help. I'm sure it wouldn't be a, uh, a hard task to find people to join you. Uh, no, I, I'm generally inundated with people offering their services to uh, to taste. Everybody's friend. Yeah, unfortunately, most most people that come and taste neglect to write any notes that are legible. So <laughs> you need to pick and choose your tasters. Yeah, uh, I, I, wanna, I think one of the best tasting notes I got from a, a I say a, a panel. Um, you know, the tasting note was hotter than like a horseradish riding a motorcycle. I'm like, hmm, okay. <laughs> Put that on the bottle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you for the offer, Danny. Um, and I'm sure we'll cross paths at some point and I'm going to make you write some tasting notes. Definitely. And we've also had um, Mark Teague. Oh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, saying it's time to upgrade to steam heating. For the still? Yep. Does Mark know how much it costs to upgrade to steam heating? Because I don't, and I don't want to ask. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. So I think I've, I've scrolled to the bottom of our questions there on, on Facebook. Yeah. But no, I think the main thing everyone would be in for would definitely be the tasting. <laughs> I'll, I'll be hitting you up for that when I do come down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're only sort of 10 minutes from the city, so very accessible by Uber. So you are, yeah, right in the heart of Hobart yeah. there. Yeah, yeah we're, we're pretty close. We're one of the closest distilleries to the city. Um, and we just sort of fly under the radar here. Nobody really knows we're here. There's just an old industrial building, no signage or anything. Um, it tends to work for us. Well, yeah, I'm looking at it on Street View, and all I can see is statewide constructions. Yeah, or... so that's our head office because we're smart and we don't put our actual address. Ah. Yeah, so um, the owner's got a construction company as well, so that's where we feed a lot of our phone calls uh, from right. call the office. I'm like, yeah, where do you fit a chicken farm in there? Yeah, so, you, you know, it's not our first radio. We know what we're doing. <laughs> all right, I'll hunt it down. I'll find okay. it. Just message me on Facebook or ring me or email me or all of those it. things. There's been a few whiskey enthusiasts that have sniffed us out. Um, yeah, they just sort of come knocking on the door. I'm not sure how they find it, but they do. Mm. Well, they just rock up. Yeah. Knock on the door, literally. Yeah. Yeah, it's happened. <laughs> I thought they were going to be chickens. <laughs> uh, we did have somebody call in last week looking for egg cartons so that was yeah but this this hasn't been um, an egg factory for quite a while now so I'm not sure what that was all about they're probably just casing the place maybe mm. good score so as you said as you, as you said John if anyone wants to get down there and you know See, see what you're up to in that. They just drop you a note, drop you an email, get on the yeah. website. What's the best way, mate? Oh, anything. I um, I cover all the social media. I cover the emails. I cover the phone. Um, yeah. Just just people, uh, they'll work it out. If they can't work it out, they can't come in, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Not rocket science. <laughs> Unless they're looking for eggs. Yeah. Well, we put your, the link to the website onto the Facebook uh, chat. Uh, so hopefully uh, people will get on that, get themselves some uh, some signature, some jam, 
<laughs> and some uh, coffee beans. Um, oh, and I just know I hadn't noticed it earlier as well. You triple distilled malt vodka. Yeah, so we have a vodka as well. Um, just because, you know, every now and again, it's nice to have a vodka. Mm, 100%. On those hot days, just glass of ice and some vodka. Beautiful. Yep, yeah, that's it. I am I am super lazy when it comes to drinking, so I don't bother with mixes or anything. I just need something I can grab and a glass I can put into, you know, put into the glass. Um, but the vodka drinks really well. Triple distilled. So we run it twice through the pop still, so it's similar to when you make spirit, then we run it through our column still as well. We've got a reflux still here. So Okay, uh, right. And using the same mash bill, John, or is it a, a different approach? Hundred percent Tasmania malt yeah. That's it. Yeah. Just yeah. Keep, keep it simple. That's it. We um everybody like I do really like peated spirit, and everyone's like, oh, you should do peated you know spirit, and that's fine. But that's a whole new kettle of fish. We just want to perfect absolutely everything first, get it running efficiently, be super happy with everything we're doing, and then we'll look at you know mixing it up a bit. But just keep it simple. Yeah, nice. Well, it all sounds good, John. It all sounds like it's. It's definitely come together and uh, you're making a name for yourself and you're, you're active, you're out there all the time on social media and uh, people know who you are. Yeah, no, well, that's it. I am just, I, I just love it. Like best industry I've ever worked in. Just so, so receptive to people, other people and just so much fun to work in. You must be due for a trip down to Hobart soon, Crafty as well. Yeah, it's on the, on the cards sometime in uh, 2021. Not yeah. too sure when, but uh, yeah, and no, I, I, I'd love to come come back down. I've been there a few times, and every time I go down there, it's yeah, it's just great. It's a new experience. Um, you know, friends down there, and different distilleries and things going on. It's it is a spiritual home of Australian whiskey, no question about that. Yeah, no, definitely. When you come down, let me know. You come in. You can. I'll put you on the tasting panel. I get you to do some cask assessment. You'll have to give me the address, mate, because I have no idea. <laughs> you'll, I'll, I'll pick you up from the hotel. I don't think the address is safe with you. You'll just you'll pass it on to too many people. <laughs> Probably safer. Yeah. I, I just realised how dark it was here. I've got like no front-facing light. I just look like a bit of a silhouette on your stream. It's getting. It is getting darker. You're, you're looking decidedly more dark. <laughs> yes. Dark and brooding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. I reckon it's um, it's been a good a good chat, good shooting the shit, John. It's it's been great. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll keep doing what you're doing, and um, we'll catch up in Hobart. If not Hobart, we'll catch up in, in Sydney for sure. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you so thank you three so much for having me on here. It's been been fun as I expected, and um, yeah, and no, we'll have to catch up soon and. I really enjoyed your uh, your first release and everything you've done, Crafty. So I'm looking thanks, to mate. What you bring out, uh, thanks. 2021, it's going to be good. Awesome. All good for us for 2021. Here's opening, eh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, mate. We'll catch you around. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Thank you.